A is actually my least favourite lecture that I have to give to students because, in a sense, you will have all done this in some variation before. It doesn't matter what your background is, what courses you did before coming here, what subjects you did, you will have had to sit through something like this previously. So, I want to focus on something different here. This is not me telling you how to do something that you already know to do. This is me telling you how to do something in a way that the people, like me, or like all those other people over in the digital technium, that mark your work, this is how they want it to be done. So if you approach this as in, I already know this stuff, I know what to do, but this is how these guys expect me to do it in order to get marks. This should be helpful. The final part of this lecture is going to be very, very helpful because it is based around assignment two for this module, where I'm basically going to tell you how to answer assignment two, the 500 word summary of William Merrill's chapter, which on that note, you should have started reading by now. If not, don't worry. If you want to get the referencing exam out of the way first and then move on to it, I understand that. You do one thing at a time and that's fine. So if you start it tomorrow or Thursday, that's absolutely fine. On the, this note, so I sent this out this morning about the referencing exam. I've told you how to access it and so on, um, just to actually show you. On Canvas, you'll see this tab in the left-hand column, assignments. If you hit it, Obviously, this is my view. You can see things that I can't see, but there's a reason for this. And if you hit this tomorrow, it will load up the exam for you. 20 questions. Take as long as you want to do them. Use whatever you want to answer those questions. Look the answers up online. Use the referencing guide you've been given. Anything you see fit. The only thing I want you to do is get higher than 14. I want everyone in this class to get higher than 14. Okay? That doesn't mean you're perfect at doing this. It just means you've got a first your first assignment in university, which should be really good. But that gives you some indication as well. You can get six wrong and still get a really good mark. So it's not even that difficult. This is easier than like a driving theory test. Because you can only get like two wrong or something like that, right? Which is kind of important if you're driving a ton of steel around and you're going to kill people with it. But you should actually do things well. You know, I did I did driving theory test. I was like one of the first people in Britain ever to do it. And it was paper and it was multiple choice and you only had to get 16 out of 35. I just guessed. I'm a shit driver, mate. Um, so, what is also important, the reason why I've left my view of this up, you will see here they've actually got the names of these wrong, so I will go in and change these very shortly. But MS100, Introduction to Media Communication, Assignment 3, it says here. It's not Assignment 3, it's Assignment 2. The date for that assignment is going to be the 7th of November, 2023, by 2 p.m. So your summary task will need to be submitted on the 7th of November at 2 p.m. Unless you have mitigating circumstances for that, in which I will be informed. So please take a note of that. Assignment 2 do we November the 7th at 2 p.m. or before 2 p.m. I don't know if anyone's ever said this, <coughs> I suspect they haven't. It's a very, very bad idea to try and submit assignments right on the 2 p.m. deadline. The reason for this is it's not just you who's going to be submitting at that time that assignment. There are assignments being submitted all across the institution. There are hundreds of courses and thousands of modules going on in this university at the time. That time, there will be an overload on the system at 2pm, people trying to submit assignments. Inevitably, somebody emails me at like 5 past 2 saying, I couldn't submit because it left me hanging, the website crashed, etc. I would recommend that the latest you submit an assignment is 1.30. Get that out of the way. The last half hour before an assignment comes in, it's an absolute nightmare. 
So please do give yourself a little bit of time to submit before that. Object lesson in how to make life difficult for yourself right there. I'm, so I'm quite impressed. Do we, uh... <laughs> level of commitment to physical exercise that I can't relate to this time of morning. Does anyone have any questions about tomorrow or about <coughs> time the two deadline or anything like that at this point? This is a good question. For the assignment tomorrow, is there any particular time you need to finish by? You only need to finish by midnight tomorrow night. That's it. Any other time of the day is fine. This gets marked automatically on the system, so it's not like I'm going in and marking them or anything like that. So I have set it, it will become live at midnight tonight, I guess, and it will run for 24 hours. It's a window for it. If for any reason you can't access it tomorrow, let me know. If there's a big problem and it's like you can't get to a computer for some reason, and this does happen, like people have to. I, a couple of years ago, somebody broke their leg. They went on a test on Tuesday night, broke their leg, and they were like, I can't do the test. And said, why is that? And texted me, you know, emailing me off the phone. And said, I'm in Marston Hospital, I've got a broken leg. And said, well, you could do it. There's nothing, you know, it's not stopping you using your hands, but I did give them the way and said, I can do it next week. If something like that comes up, I will obviously move it for you. But if somebody. Somebody emails me tomorrow night at like, uh, like quarter to um, 12 and it's like, I haven't started it yet, can I have more time? Well, I'm not going to answer anyway. It's like, I'm not. Actually, I'm going to the pub tomorrow night. So I can guarantee by quarter to 12 I'll be asleep because I will have had like eight pints and I'll be dying. So yeah, it's not going to happen. But aside from my drunkenness, if there is an issue, and as I said in the announcement this morning, this is supposed to be very, very straightforward, easy. I'm not going to pretend it's something enjoyable, but... Something. This session is going to take you through... Oh, fuck off, Ben. Excuse me while I mess around with the settings on this for a second. So this is um, something I have shared in the past with... It's worth talking about these guys, I guess. The voice you just heard then was um, Ben Martin. Ben Martin works for the Centre for Academic Success. So a few years ago we put this presentation together specifically for media students to target what we think media students need to know with regards to getting the highest marks possible in assignments. With that in mind, if you think you need any assistance with an assignment, you can go to the centre to act for academic success. They're based in the library. All you have to do is go into the library. There's an information desk. You can walk through the <coughs> information desk is on the right hand side. If you're going to talk to somebody in the information desk, they will put you in touch with somebody in the centre for academic success. Now the good thing about our subject in particular is we've worked a lot with them over the past five years. So they have a load of stuff specifically for media students. Other departments don't tend to engage with them as much as we do, so it's been kind of fortunate they've been able to develop a bunch of stuff which is actually focused on us as well because we put the time and effort in to actually work with them on this. So there's Ben and there's Pete as well, uh, Pete uh, Hanratty, who is one of my PhD students. Pete, actually, a media specialist, works in that department, so he'll work with you on assignments if you go and ask for assistance. The one thing I think people find difficult about asking for assistance with assignments is you think, does that make me look stupid? Does that make me look like no, it doesn't. What it makes you look like is that you're serious about getting a good mark. And that, at the end of the day, is what you want, right? So if you do have specific needs or requirements or you just want some help and you feel you... This is so fun. Um, why do I forget every week as well? What's the matter with me? You done yet? No? Okay, well.
<laughs> that building, I used to have lectures in that building when I was a student. It used to be always on fire, that building. This is where the chemistry labs are. Um, <laughs> so it's like every day there was a fire alarm in there. Okay, I lost my train of thought a little bit. Um, this session that, uh, not just Ben, actually, a couple of other people and I put together about three, four years ago now, is specifically aimed not at being absolutely patronising, or it's going to feel patronising at times, but it's aimed at what we want you to do in order to achieve a particular set of assignments. Now, I'm going to let you know a little bit about how cynical life is here. You, sir, have we ever spoken before? Do you know what degree <coughs> I want you to get? Considering we've never even spoken before. Why would you assume that? It's the best one. Do you want to get that? Ideally, you do. Why do I want you to get that? But, but you are right. That is what I want you to get. Now, from a more benevolent perspective, it's absolutely correct. Because I want the best for you and the best outcomes for you. And I want you to have a good life after this institution, right? But on a much more what we call instrumental scale, if you get a first, that looks good on my statistics. I have what we call KPIs, key performance indicators. I want you all to get first, because that would blow my KPIs out the fucking window. I could just walk into the office and say, money, money, money. I want money. Let's see how good I am at this job. Give me money. Now, there are two ways I can go about doing this. One, I can rig all the assignments and not bother marking them very well, so I just hand out first. But that's fraught with difficulty, because at some point somebody is going to look at those, they're called moderators, and they're going to look, Blayton's not even taking this job serious. I mean, we knew he wasn't taking it seriously beforehand, but now he's really taking the best. So I can't do that. So they said, the other way I've got to do it is by actually telling you how to get a first class degree in the first instance, right? If I do that, then you can go away and do it. And I don't have to cheat and I don't have to get fired, and I don't have to end up living in a bin. Because yeah? that would be the outcome. I don't want that outcome. Instead, I want you to get a first by me telling you actually what you need to do. So, this is the purpose of doing this. First point about doing any assignment in a university setting, and I'm using the word reader here, because assignments primarily are going to be read, even if they're actually even if they're video stuff, what we do is kind of take a reading approach to them. We look at the video and we look at how things we put together and then the information's in it rather than look at the visuals very often. So, first point, know your reader. Know who it is that you are writing or producing this assignment for. I can't actually stress how important this is. And this, I think, is one of the big differences between doing assignments at university and doing assignments at a pre-HE environment. Very often, when you're doing assignments, say if you've done A-levels to come to this um, stage in your life, you won't know who is reading that A-level examination or piece of coursework. It gets sent away to some random... <coughs> random's a bit unfair, I mean, it's obviously somebody with subject knowledge, but it's somebody you wouldn't actually know personally. In this environment, you do know the person who's going to be marking it. MS100 assignments, me. MS114 is doing that module, Elena. MS103, Joanna. Now, I think Joanna's wonderful, but you better write Joanna. If you're doing film studies, you have to write properly because Joanna puts up no shit whatsoever. She's not brute, though, she's just very precise. Know who is actually doing this, and know what their expectations are going to be. Now, lecturers will tell you what their expectations are. We will not hide that from you. 
Pass me a fair, it's like fucked up picture. Check that out. That's actually me. Yeah, I know too. <laughs> I say I got a funny thing with pictures. These are like different people. Do you the person underneath me is as well? expect it to be the same as if you were writing it for Jermaine Greer on the right, or Ernest Hemingway underneath. Ernest Hemingway would expect you to write some kind of florid fucking literary thing where, you know, you've got allegory and you've got metaphor and all this crap, right? And that's great for literature people and I'm sure they're excited to be a part of that. Not me. I don't want that. So, what do you think I want? going to be writing an assignment for me, as we just said, coming in on November the 7th. What do you think I want? Yeah. Academic integrity. Well, do I want that? Yes. I would like your work to illustrate the principles of academic integrity. That means, one, no cheating. To acknowledge your sources. Anything else? Brilliant. Okay. I'm already telling you stuff you know. The most important principle for submitting any assignment in media studies is this. One word, very, very simple. Clarity. Write it down. Your word needs to be clear. There is no more frustrating thing than having an assignment handed in and you can't understand what that person is trying to say. You might think, <coughs> does that happen a lot? Hell yes, it happens a lot. I don't know what happens to people when they get to university that they think they have to ditch common sense language and write in some sort of style which they feel makes them look smart. You're already smart or you wouldn't be here. Okay, You don't have to prove that by using the sort of language which makes me want to pick up my computer and throw it out the fucking window when I'm trying to mark something. I hate it when people <coughs> think that it's a good idea that you use the thesaurus function on Word to improve your language. No. Write Clearly, make it easy to understand. Treat me as if I'm a moron. Okay? Do you know why? I've got hundreds of these tomorrow. The clearer it is, the better it is for me. <coughs> when I see something that's, you know, all of a sudden starts dropping adverbs into every sentence, and you're like, fuck this. How am I doing this? <coughs> I have to look up the word, Your work must be clear. Any lecturer is never going to penalise somebody for writing clearly. Never going to happen. You might be penalised for writing unclearly, for writing with undue complication, but you're never going to be penalised for the other. Okay? So that is the first main point that I want to make today. And it does really, really make a difference in terms of assignments. Students that write clearly, concisely, they communicate points better, they analyse things better, their descriptions are clearer, and their conclusions are clearer, and you can follow the flow of a piece of writing in a far easier way. So always, when you're approaching assignment, ask yourself, Right, who's going to be marking this? Who's the person who's lecturing this course? What do they want me to do? They will tell you that. That is something which we are duty bound to do. We give you our assumptions about what we want. What you can assume are these things, always too. 
They are probably well educated. You know, I don't want to blow my own trumpet, but I've got a lot of fucking letters on me. Okay? I am what you would call well educated. So, the language you use to communicate should be of a certain what we call register. Formal and clear. That is an academic style of writing. I am also busy. I have hundreds of these damn things to do and a very limited amount of time to do them in. Therefore, you know, so everyone's going to be handing in a 2,000 word essay in January, right? There's a hundred, about 90 <coughs> people enrolled in this module. You wouldn't know it from 10 years, but there are. So, if everyone wrote up to the word count, anyone want to do maths? 182,000 words. I have to read 182,000 words in two weeks, mark and give feedback on each of those. I have a two-week window to do all that. Plus, I've got my third year's hand in there, I say, at the time, which are 3,000 words. There are 20 of those. It's another 60,000 words on top. So that takes it up to a beautiful 240,000 words that I have in a little period in January to get done. I'm busy. So, Make it easy for me to see that you have understood the material and you know how to answer the question. That's the purpose of the writing. I also have a lot of essays with the same title as yours, so make yours stand out. How do you do that? You do it in two ways. One, you make sure you reference the correct material, and two, you make sure you answer the question. And you might think, well, oh, answer the question. How would you do it? So many people don't answer the question they've been asked. So many people just want to give their opinion on this topic. That's not the answer. Answering the question involves using research, evidence, and theory to propose an argument about the question. I'll come back to arguments later. I am extremely learned. <laughs> what a word. I'm learned <laughs> in that subject. So I don't need you to explain a concept to me like it's an introductory textbook. Because I already know what it is. Brief explanation of it would suffice. When you're writing for somebody at university, you can make a very good assumption that they know. But most importantly, I'm interested in your ideas. The best essays, the ones that stand out, the best assignments of any kind are where students bring out their ideas <coughs> within notable caution. Your ideas must reflect on the material that you have taught and that you've read. That's important. Just having ideas of your own, you know that the principle of I've done my own research. Fuck out. I'm not interested in your research. I'm not interested in what you Google. I want you to build on the actual knowledge and um, theory that's been done in this area. But students who can express their own argument confidently and on the basis of the work that they've done, you're going to ace it. Now, has anyone ever seen this before? No? Anyone? You've seen Bloom's Taxonomy? In what context? Uh, I, did, uh, I did a course last year. Okay, so yeah. you've probably seen this diagram. Yeah. yeah. <coughs> Actually, let me go back. In the context of Bloom's taxonomy, we don't test things at the bottom of the university. You don't do well. Ironically, you're doing exams tomorrow, I'm saying. But it's not a memory test of any kind. You don't have to have remember the entire BPA system to do the exam. Remembering and understanding are taken as givens at this level. What we're actually looking at is application, analysis, evaluation, and creation. Now, creation at the top, and you can see actually how you plot your way through the three years of a degree. But creation sort of comes in year three when you create your own materials, your own assignments, your own <coughs> dissertation, for example. In years one and two, what we're interested in is your skills and application of knowledge, analysis, and evaluation. All of this is always done through the lens of what we call critical thinking. I would 
said this last week, so just as an adjoining to it, what does the word critical mean in this context? <coughs> refers to one thing and it means this my friends whenever you see the word critical it means based on evidence and knowledge that evidence and knowledge is not yours a critical approach is based on evidence and knowledge of experts in the field which you are engaged in so whenever you see somebody say critically examine they are asking you to examine something using knowledge and evidence based on experts in the field which you're examining. That is what critical means. You will see the word all the time over the next few years. It will be used throughout your career. That is what we're actually talking about. Basically, in Bloom's taxonomy, what happens is these things are what happens <coughs> at a school level. The top level is at a tertiary or higher level. It's the foundation of the education system. Now, what does this actually mean in practice? So these are the titles <coughs> that um, I've put in the module handbook for your essays. When you're reading essay titles, look at exactly what you are being asked to do. Again, you will be surprised that people don't do this. They will see sort of this top one, explain how discourses work to legitimize the ideologies of ruling elites in society with reference to one particular <coughs> form of media discourse. And then they'll just do an essay describing what discourse is. And that's not what's being asked. I'm asking you to explain how discourses are used to specifically do a particular purpose, which is to legitimise a particular set of ideas of the ruling dominant class in society. When we do lectures on discourse, this will become clearer. Especially what I'm talking about right now. If you look at the second question, Theodore Adorno famously claimed that all mass culture is identical. Critically evaluate this claim. What I'm asking you to do here is not just to evaluate Theodore Adorno's claim, but use evidence, theory, and research done by experts in the field to support your argument about Theodore Adorno's claim. Theodore Adorno's claim is very strong, but it is also open to criticism. So it's actually going to be a two-sided essay. Yes, yeah, so you can support Adorno, but you can also criticise him on this basis. Third one. What did Marshall McLuhan mean when he stated that the medium is the message made reference to at least two different mediums? What I'm asking you to do in that essay is explain critically what Marshall McLuhan meant by that term. I'm always asking you to refer not just to McLuhan's work, but to other theorists who have worked on McLuhan's material about what that phrase actually means. And it's one of the most misunderstood phrases that there are. So, Good luck if you do that one. Okay. So, I'm asking you to be critical all the time. How do you do that? <coughs> you read. Mm. We assume that reading means <coughs> this. If you pick up a book, very boring, very dull, and I would be an absolute fool to suggest that that's what every student does. I would be an absolute fool to suggest that's what every student who walks out of this degree with a first class degree does. Reading does not need to be a chore, and it doesn't need to be something that you're bored of doing either. There are shortcuts. If you were ever to pick up one of my books that I've written, you will see a bibliography at the end of it that has hundreds and hundreds 
of references in it. If you were ever to look up my PhD thesis, which is in the library in Swansea, about 500 references in that. Now, by a show of hands, does anyone believe for one second I've read it? every one of those references? Good. Am I cheating? No. I don't know anyone who's ever done something of that scale and read everything in it. It would have taken me about a decade to read all that stuff. I would have never have finished the course. It can't be done. So, we have to read in a targeted way. I have given you a textbook for this module, for example. Do I expect anyone to read it from cover to cover? What I might expect you to do reasonably is, if you're going to sit aside, you're going to do an assignment on discourse, go to the index in that textbook, look up the word discourse, and then go to the pages where it's mentioned. Bang. You're getting all the relevant material out of it. So you've already taken 95% of that book out of the equation. You just have to read the 15 pages that actually cover the topic in hand. That's a simple, basic way of doing it, but it kind of does this as well. What you should be doing when you actually read the relevant material is ask yourself questions. The major question that you should ask is this. Does this help me answer the question I am trying to do? If you feel that what you are reading doesn't help, close the book or close the window if you're reading it as an e-book and move on to something else. Don't waste your time reading stuff which is irrelevant and isn't helpful. It's kind of mad, but I know people say, I've read so much for this, and they tell me, hey, what did you read it? I've been reading this one. Why did you read that? Nothing to do with this. It's a waste of your time, and time is limited and finite. So always ask yourself, is this actually helping me? And always then ask yourself, how is this material going to be used in the essay that I'm writing, or the assignment I'm doing, or the presentation that I'm doing, or the video that I'm doing? Don't feel just, it's a great joke in The Simpsons about this. Right, when, um, it's like Bart and Milhouse become conspiracy theorists, and they get this book about UFOs, and then Bart's like, yeah, well, UFOs are all this government conspiracy and it's being covered up. He said, wow, it's in a book, so it must be true. Books are full of shit. Books are not <laughs> reliable sources. Ask yourself, what is a reliable source for something? You know all the stuff in the module handbook that I've given you? That's reliable. Do you know what I know? I read that. I read other stuff as well, which isn't in the module handbook, and I put it in there. I don't think it's useful. I don't think it's relevant. The stuff that I've actually directed you towards, I know that's useful and relevant because pretty much based the entire course on that kind of stuff. So, always be looking at what you can use properly. Don't just feel, oh, read for the sake of it. I'm going to read this book and then I'll be able to do it. It doesn't work that way. So, if you need suggestions for what to read for something, again, <coughs> ask the people who actually set the questions. Or ask the people who set the assignments. They will give you the suggestions of what you should be looking at. If it's not already in the handbooks which they put together, just go and ask them. It's absolutely fine. That becomes much more important in year three when you've got to do a dissertation, which is your own question, is assigned to somebody then who's an expert in that area. Always be writing, reading these sort of things. We've actually got to engage at this stage with why people are doing things. Why did the author write? What is their position on this? Is that a position which is helpful to me? Books aren't written from neutral perspectives. You might have a position on a question and you'll read something by somebody who's arguing from a completely different position than you are. That makes that word really difficult to integrate with your own thoughts on something. So always be asking yourself this. Ask yourself, is this any different from other stuff that I've read? If you're looking and thinking, actually, this is saying nothing new, stop. Don't waste your time. Why would you, why would you reread something? You already know that knowledge. If it's just saying exactly the same thing, this is the most important thing. Does it build my argument? Is it something that I can use? 
If it's not, give up. It sounds awful, right? So no, just give up. <laughs> no, I'm being serious. There's not enough time in the world to be wasting your time reading stuff which isn't relevant. Now, you might want to read for leisure, but that's great, but you're not going to read media textbooks for leisure. If you do, you are head tapped. You, know? you, you really do need to you know, I don't know, stop drinking heavily, take some drugs, and anything. Don't fucking do that. It's terrible. So, always be thinking of these things. If you're reading for the purpose of understanding a topic, always ask yourself, can you understand what these people are saying? If you can't, stop, find something different. And you know, I think, there's a lot of stuff out there. You know, there's a whole time for honesty here. There's a whole bunch of stuff written by academics. I pick it up and I look at it and think, nah, not reading that. I can't, if like, but from the first paragraph of what somebody's read, it's like, nah, fuck this. This looks like a lot of effort to try and understand. This is written in a style which I don't appreciate. So I'm not reading it. I would go and read something else on this topic instead. Something which is actually useful and clear. Unfortunately, a lot of academics are so far up their own analysis that they will write in that way. If you encounter that stuff and you can't understand it, I'll find something else. Don't waste your time. Always ask yourself, can you actually summarize the ideas that are being done here? Can you put something into a sentence or two? If you can, that means it's useful. If you're able to engage with the material and then boil it down in that way, that means you've understood it, it's clear, and it's useful. And can you map the idea? I'll come on to idea mapping later, but that's something that you should always look to do. Always be asking these questions, but when you're reading for analysis, these are the sort of things that we actually <coughs> want to see. Always be asking yourself, can you identify the main argument that somebody's putting forward? And then, if you want to go really up to the first class level, ask yourself what's next, not there. Arguments are always partial. They are never full. Because there's always a different way that you could approach them. So an argument for something will say something, but it won't consider everything in it. So in terms of analysis, what you need to be anticipating, if you want to be at that super high mark level, is, OK, so Marx said this, but he didn't consider this. That's another part of your assignment which shows that you understand it in this way. What methods did they use to arrive at their argument? And how is this related to other material you've read on the subject? Because that's how you actually critically evaluate stuff, is by relating it to other material in the subject. This is difficult. It involves a number of different things to be able to write at a high level doing this, and, and to even read at a high level. One, it involves time. You actually have to, have to give yourself time and space to read things, and read them carefully. Two, it involves integrating other knowledge into your reading process. You will already know other things, for example. You will have been taught stuff. You will have read stuff. The reason why this module is designed in the way it is when we get actually onto the module content, as I call it, next week, is because it automatically then gives you material to start doing this in your other modules. You will have already done the political economy approach to media. So when you are looking at journalistic sources, you will already know the arguments surrounding omission of media, for example, or political bias, or ideological bias, because we would have covered it in this module. This point about methods, how did they come to this? That's very, very important in that how, you know, how did they follow the rules that I'm asking you to do? Did they build upon the knowledge of other people? Or is this just some idea which was pulled out of the sky? If it is, do we have to accept it? No. We can critique that. When you're looking to evaluate what we're asking you to do, do you agree with it or not? Do you agree with this point of view? An evaluation is effectively, do you think this argument is effective? 
Is it convincing? Does it stand up to close scrutiny? So, for example, in, uh, well, after the study break, I'll look at um, Frankfurt School and Cultural Studies in general, and look specifically at Theodore, Theodore Dorner's idea that all mass media is identical. That is an argument. What we will look at in that lecture is does that argument actually stand up to close scrutiny? So there's some validity to it. He's still an important thing. He's been dead for 70 years, but he's still somebody that's talked about in cultural studies, not just in media, but in literature, etc. Right? So obviously his ideas have some importance. <coughs> what we're going to look at is, can we topple them over? Can we actually say, actually, the other one almost got big problems here? <coughs> what we should do, in reality, is not just say, yeah, Adorno's arguments here are the shit because we should do it in reference to other thinkers who support our argument there. We should always be looking to understand what this means. <coughs> Any questions so far? Okay. So, how do we do this through reading? Right, firstly, search for material which is relevant. Identify keywords that you need to look for and search for them. Search for the material which is most relevant for them. Where do we search for relevant academic material? Using the library service is a good start. The library search engine is called iFind. That will take you to relevant academic materials. Anywhere else? Google's got it. Yeah. If you're going to use Google, do not use Google. Instead, you Scholar, which is the academic search engine embedded in the Google search engine. Many people sitting in this room right now are going to do this. They are going to search for keywords about their assignment or essay on google.co.uk. And it is going to take you to a whole bunch of interesting and informative web sources on that material. And what is going to happen when you use them in your essay? <coughs> everyone's going to use the same things. Well, potentially everyone's going to use the same things, but actually, that's not as important as what's going to actually happen. Or you're going to fail. I'm going to take one look at your bibliography and automatically give you 30. makes my job of marking all those essays so much easier. But it then actually conflicts with the whole thing I was talking about at the beginning. So I need you, in order to make bank, I need you all to get 70 plus. Why would you fail? Why would looking things up on Google and just using the first things that you find off the Google search engine, why would that be fail? What's the problem with doing that? Anyone know? Is it under plagiarism? It doesn't necessarily have to. It could, it could but it doesn't. Have, but there's a potential for that, but that's perhaps a different issue. Grace? People could edit it, it might not be accurate. Aha. Uh -huh. The editing thing I'm not so worried about. The accuracy thing I am worried about. Web sources are not. I could go back to my office right now and make a website. It's not something difficult to do. Anyone can do it. I'd say the, the ultimate site for understanding the political economy approach to the media. And I could put any old junk on it. And using some search engine optimization techniques, which again, any fool can learn, takes like two minutes, it will appear at the top of every search political economy of media, my little website. And you can go on it and read it, and put all that stuff in your essay, it's junk. Absolute junk. The difference is this. I'll tell you a little bit about how this works. I'm writing a textbook at the moment based on this module for the publishing company Sage. 
they asked me for an outline of this module. I sent it to them and said, will you write us a textbook about media studies based on what you teach you? I said, yes, Mr. Sage, I will do that. Every chapter that I write for that textbook, I have to submit <coughs> back to the publisher. They send it to five reviewers who are all experts on that topic. That then comes back to me with corrections to make. Those subject experts tell me, actually, this is wrong, this is wrong, this is wrong. You need to say this this way, you need to do this, you need to do that, you need to include this, you need to include that. And that comes from five different people. And then I have to do all that work and resubmit it to the same five people again. And they check over it again. Academic work, academic material, published academic material, isn't stuff that you just shove up on a website. It is stuff which has been looked at and assessed and evaluated by experts to make sure that the material in that is correct. And actually, when I'm doing reviews of things, which I do a lot, then we go back to the office and doing a review of book proposals right now in virtual reality when we finish this. I'm going to be making suggestions for how that book can be useful. One of the most important things academic reviewers is they look at material and suggest, right, it's not just about is this correct, but how can it actually be useful for people to understand the new concept of like reading this? That's a very, very important aspect of this. Set up your own website, it doesn't do that. It's not what it's for. That's the difference. Okay? This is why when you search for reading in a degree, it means you search specifically for academic material. That means academic books, academic journals. Primarily those are the two sources of information you will have. Once you've found your relevant material, I would then give that material a scan. I mean, just have a quick look over it. That will tell you where the relevant stuff is. So if you've got a nice little textbook, media studies textbook, have a scan of it. Make a, get a highlight pen out on, if you, you know, do that. If you don't like highlighting books because you think that's kind of hard to read the books and really precious about them, it's not sticky. I use sticky tabs, you know. I unpack the sticky tabs so I can read the good idea. You buy them in the shop or whatever. Skim. The chapter introduction and the paragraph heads and the paragraph summaries of the chapter conclusion. Before I read anything, I just read the introduction. That will tell me if it's useful. Because it will tell me what the rest of the chapter is going to say. An introduction tells you what everything else is going to say in that chapter. So if I look at the introduction and it's not anything in there, ah. then I speed read it to see if it's actually relevant. And then I actually read it in detail. So there's a whole bunch of stages you can go through to sift through anything to see if it's actually relevant to what you're doing. And that process as well helps you understand what it is you're going to be doing as well. You don't have to read a You certainly don't have to read a whole book. I can't think of one assignment you will do in university which requires you reading a whole book. Very often you don't have to read the whole chapter of something. Sometimes, let me expand that, often you don't even have to read a whole page. It will be about finding the relevant information that you need <coughs> in something, which can very often be a few <coughs> lines or a paragraph at most. But it's about finding that. <coughs> that means, when I'm asking you I want at least five different academic sources used. The thing that instantly comes to people's heads is, shit, I've got to like, read a book, and I've got to read an entire journal article. I'm not asking you to do that. I'm asking you to use academic sources. Most of the time, that does not involve reading the whole of anything. It involves you finding the relevant information in it and using it. <coughs> That's it. It is not the daunting, intimidating task that you do. And the more you do this, 
the easier it becomes, the faster you become at it, the more efficient you become at it, the better you become at it. So by the time you're in year three, you've moved from using five sources in your essay to using 25 in the same amount of time, with the same amount of effort, because you become more efficient at searching, you become more efficient at actually filtering out the noise that you don't need, you become more efficient at actually finding material within academic sources which is relevant and more efficient at using them to fact. The difference between year one and year three, just with practice of doing this, is extreme. People all of a sudden will be looking to you. At this stage, I know when it comes, I know what's going to happen in December and January. Like, how many sources, how many references, how many things, how much? Uh, <laughs> and by year three, you don't get those questions. It just doesn't occur to people to ask that anymore because they work out that it's actually easy to do. But I appreciate it. At this stage, it's not easy to do. I get that. Because you've been asked to do something you haven't asked to do before. That's always a challenge. But the more you do it now, the easier it will become. You will find your way of doing it. George's way of doing it is going to be different than yours. It's going to be different than both. Right? Everyone's got different ways of actually doing this. We all be roughly doing the same thing. But it, it, you, will, you will tailor it to suit how you are as a person and how you study. Okay, let's have five minutes and then I'll rush through the rest of this and then I'm going to tell you what to get in the first or second. <laughs> I'm so glad you said that. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not keeping you away, Chris. <laughs> Terrible. <laughs>